Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the first of a series of four webinars that we are hosting on building resilient communities. Uh, my name is Misty Hergett, and I'm with the North Carolina Rural Center. Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Rural Center, we are a private nonprofit organization. Uh, we have been around for 33 years, and our focus is economic development uh, and helping our rural communities across the state, 80 of those communities, to uh, strengthen and, and build upon uh, their, their strengths with economic and community development. Uh, some of our focus areas at the center are uh, leadership and community engagement, research and advocacy, and our business lending programs. And for more information on that, you can visit our website at ncruralcenter.org. Again, we are thrilled to have you all join us today for our first of four webinars. Uh, today is gonna be focusing on uh, laying the foundation, key concepts, and the why to importance of resilient strategies. I want to thank the Red Cross for being a generous supporter in this series of webinars. Uh, if you want more information on the three additional ones, uh, you can visit our website as well, again, ncruralcenter.org for more information. And we'll also uh, provide some more details around how to sign up for those at the end of the webinar today. Uh, while we know uh, for some of you, resiliency may not be as familiar of a concept. Uh, we know for many of you uh, that it is and that uh, rural individuals and communities are uh, consistently innovative, resourceful, and resilient, uh, whether it be with natural disasters, uh, economic disasters, a pandemic, so on and so forth. So uh, today we're gonna, our focus is gonna be on natural disasters. Uh, one other announcement I have that's uh, kind of a continuation of this work that we are very excited at the Rural Center to be a part of, we are, uh, have recently formed a partnership with the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency uh, to launch the uh, Resilient Communities Program, and this is uh, supported by Economic Development Administration. Uh, the program will be over a year and a half, uh, focused on Florence and Michael disaster affected counties and we will be offering training, a training program, as well as coaching uh, for local community and regional project teams to develop uh, projects around resiliency. So we're very excited about that. Stay tuned for more information on that piece. And I think we are ready to move to the next slide to talk about logistics for today. So as you all have figured out, I'm sure you're, you've been muted. Um, if you're having audio issues, you can use your phone. That tends to give a little better audio quality. Uh, at the end, we will offer time for uh, Q&A of our panelists and you can submit your questions through the Q&A feature and we will uh, feed those to the panelists to, to address those questions. Also, uh, one additional thing at the end of today's webinar, you'll be receiving a survey uh, to let us know, um, give us your feedback on, on how this went and how we can uh, continuously improve. So we'd appreciate if you could take a brief few minutes to fill that out. Uh, if you complete the survey, you will be entered into a drawing to receive uh, the personal safety emergency pack from Red Cross. Next slide. Also, if you are on social media, if you uh, would like to tweet about any of the information or content that you're hearing today, we would be grateful. Uh, the Rural Center has a Twitter account, as you can see here, Instagram and Facebook. So uh, if you would not mind tweeting and tagging us in those tweets, that would be great, or Instagram or Facebook. I'm just gonna quickly walk through the agenda and then I'll introduce uh, our speakers for today. So we've covered most of the logistics. Um, we're going to begin with uh, one of my esteemed colleagues, Jason Gray, who's a senior fellow for research and policy at the Rural Center to outline some critical concepts and definitions. Uh, and then we will hear from Dr. Kathy Dello, who is state climatologist and director of the state climate office at NC State University uh, to talk about climate change in the state um, and how we how we address that, economic impacts, and then we will move into the Q&A session. Uh, and again, you will submit those questions at the bottom of your screen through the Q&A function. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Gray. Thank you, Misty. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, 
be here. Um, this has been a, an effort that we have been planning for for, for some months. Um, we, we've had a tremendous learning curve ourselves in, in, in doing webinars, as well as uh, in our partnership, the good folks at the North Carolina Office of Recovering Resilience to, to begin collaboration around how we can best serve rural communities, think through resilience strategies. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so this session we're, we're laying the foundation. Okay, so we, we want to just hit some basics, uh, especially for those who, who, who don't regularly move in the whole disaster recovery world. But we're, we want to start with talking about what, what do we mean when we say the word resilience? As, as Misty suggested, it's a new concept that emphasizes a uh, characteristic that is uh, familiar to, to many rural people. Um, so there are a number of definitions available. Um, we are fortunate that the, uh, the state of North Carolina, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, uh, released earlier in the year a climate risk assessment and resilience plan. So I, I want to use their definition, then we'll, I'll talk just briefly about it. So they say a resilient North Carolina is a state where our communities, economies, and ecosystems are better able to rebound, positively adapt to, and thrive amid changing conditions and challenges, including disasters and climate change, to maintain quality of life, healthy growth, and durable systems, and to conserve resources for present and future generations. Now, that, that's an ambitious definition, but what I want to emphasize here is is to better able to re rebound and to positively adapt to and thrive in challenging conditions and um, uh, in, in the future. Because as Dr. Dello's presentation will, will suggest, we are going to have more challenges in the future. So how do we prepare? Not just to rebound to, to the status quo of where we were before, but to prepare and to live and to have our communities be better, okay? Because if we prepare better, we'll we be able to absorb to disasters and respond better. Next slide, please. So four other definitions I, I just wanna to touch on briefly before turning it over to, to Kathy. One is, is risk. Uh, risk is the possibility, the chance of an adverse outcome like property or life. Um, in preparing this, I was doing some background reading and research around public perceptions of risk, and it is a rich, complex uh, area. And, and participants we have with us who've been working in disaster management work uh, could likely say far better than myself how public perceives risk. But we have to understand this in order to be able to communicate um, to our constituencies and, and our communities. The second is hazard. Um, and I'm gonna play this through with a couple definitions um, and thank Amanda Martin at NCOR for, uh, for uh, helping me out on this because it helped, it, it was clarifying to me. So a hazard is, is a weather event, like a, say like a hurricane, but also think of it like a missing stair in a, in a staircase. A hazard is not a problem until you add people to the solution or to the situation. Isn't that the case with almost everything? That with, when you add people in, it becomes a uh, becomes more complicated. Next slide, please. Okay, exposure. Exposure is when people are literally exposed to the hazard. The hurricane makes a landfall. Or in the case of the stairs, a person tries to climb the stairs. Okay, impact is what we care about most. The impact is whether the roof of a house comes off or whether the flood waters reach the inside of the home or whether someone actually falls when they try to climb the stairs. This hazard causes the impact, but the, the conditions of the mat home matters. Is the roof adequately secured? How high is the home elevated? Um, or were residents trapped inside? These factors determine the impact. And, and in these conditions, uh, it's where questions around equity in uh, both for individuals and communities come into play because people are coming into 
disaster events at different levels of, of capacity and exposure and risk that informs an equity equation. Next slide, please. So as with resilience, so there, there's, there's a number of ways to get at uh, an equity definition. And I just wanna give a shout out uh, to our friend, Dr. John Cooper, at, uh, he's a vice president at Texas A&M and a former UNC uh, doctoral uh, uh, doctor recipient who's going to be focusing on uh, equity and um, inclusion in disaster planning in our third session on, I think, uh, October 21st. So, so the definition I want to use here is, is from, from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management um, Administration. Equity is achieved not only when everyone is provided full access to information and assistance, but when interventions are taken to ensure that all are provided with the resources necessary to meaningfully participate, make progress, and benefit from hazard mitigation. As human beings, we each have unique needs that must be met to allow meaningful participation. To realize that vision, we must work in partnership with what FEMA calls the whole community. Next slide, please. So here, here's a graphic um, I really like. Um, we, we looked at a whole bunch of them, um, many which had a similar theme, but uh, I like bicycles. So, um, so I, I, I chose this one and, and I think it's, it's illustrative to what we mean. So in the, the top of the graphic, you have uh, four differently abled individuals or, or, or four individuals with different characteristics. One who has a, a physical disability and cannot walk. Uh, a very, but they all have the same size bicycle. So you have um, you have the seven foot one ball center on on that itty bitty little bicycle. You you have um, another individual who's appropriately sized for the bicycle, and then you you got a little a little kid uh, who, who's on a bicycle that is way 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 too big for them to be safely be able to ride. So that's equality. Everyone has the same kind of bicycle. Um, but equity is when you're responding to the needs of the people or the community with where they are at the starting point. So the physically disadvantaged individual uh, has a specially prepared um, uh, tricycle or four-wheeler that gives them mobility. Uh, the large individual has an appropriately sized bicycle to their size. Um, the, 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 the third individual just, just get, gets to keep their bicycle because it, it works for them. And then the, the child has a bicycle that's it's a appropriate size. So that's a very good graphic that describes what we mean when we say the word equity. And, and it requires that this is not a passive outcome. This comes from engaging with communities and having a conversation around needs. And, and in some cases, it, it, it also highlights that you cannot have equity without justice being a part of the conversation, okay? Um, people who are, who've been disadvantaged by history or by their economic conditions or their race sometimes have to push back just to make sure that they are fairly treated in, in, in an equitable situation. So equity is an outcome of having a just civil society. So again, for all of these, we could go into greater depth, but uh, I don't want to take any more time away from, from Dr. Dello because uh, she's got a powerful message to share. And I'll come back after um, she finishes her presentation to, to just to share a little bit about economic impacts of, um, uh, around that natural disasters. So with that, um, I, want to, I want to turn it over to, to, to Dr. Dello. Her, her bio is in, um, is in the registration page. I'm not going to uh, dwell on it here. Uh, an enormously qualified individual, and, and I'm so glad we stole her away from the state of war. So Kathy, it's over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's been a wonderful 15 months in North Carolina, if not the, the year I had planned. But one of the things that I got to do before we were all sent into quarantine was meet Jason at a meeting last year in Wilson. And I think the, the message that he just sent to everybody was so wonderful and powerful. I want to bring him with me to 
every single talk that I give from here forward. So Jason, you have a tall task ahead of you. But today I'm just going to talk about the climate science, uh, hotter, wetter, more humid North Carolina. If that's the one sentence you remember from this talk, then that's pretty powerful. That's what we're planning for in climate change and that's what we're seeing right now. I direct the State Climate Office of North Carolina. We are at NC State University. I have a team of nine incredible folks who work on all aspects of weather and climate in North Carolina. And since climate touches everything and everyone, the community person angle is so important in Jason's message. We're really dealing with a, a number of sectors that have big climate questions that they need answers to. So hopefully I will um, give you some answers during this talk, but you're always welcome to reach out and engage me at a later time. Uh, so next slide. Given that it is uh, 2020 and so many things are coming at us so fast, I like to give my last slide first these days. If you uh, hit mute after this, this is really the gist of my talk that there are large future climate changes for our state if our current reliance on fossil fuels as energy continues. And that's not just North Carolina, that's not just you and me, that's not just the city of Raleigh, that's the entire planet. But we will see the impacts here in our state and we are seeing them. We don't get the luxury of talking about climate change like it's a future thing anymore. It's here, it's now, and it's in our backyard. And what this means specifically for North Carolina is temperatures outside of our historical envelope. So we'll look at some historical temperature trends. I'll tell you right now, North Carolina's warmed about a degree Fahrenheit. We're, we're going to see much greater warming in the future um, if we do not change our practices. Disruptive sea level rise, we're certainly seeing a fair bit of that um, on our coast. NC-12 closed, I think, two weeks ago due to overwash. So we're we're having higher sea levels and it makes these high tide storm events um, that much worse because we're starting at a greater level. We're going to see increases in intensity and frequency of extreme rainfall. And by extreme rainfall, I mean day, uh, days with over three inches of rain. And if you've lived in North Carolina for the past six months, you can pick out one of those events. We've had a number of them. I'm personally thinking of the one at the end of August in Wake and Johnston County where five or six inches of rain fell overnight. Massive urban flooding and you know, all sorts of nuisance flooding, basement flooding came along with that as well. And that's the kind of event that doesn't make headlines. It was, it was just a, a weather event. The events that do make headlines, the hurricanes, and I know we're coming up on an anniversary of Hurricane Matthew right now, we're expecting in climate change that our hurricanes will become more intense. And by intense, I mean stronger wind speed. Um, we know that flooding and storm surge is such a big issue with hurricanes. We know that the category of the hurricane doesn't necessarily matter. You know, Florence was a category one. It doesn't need to be a category five to cause big destruction in our state. And then higher absolute humidity levels. So those humid days that we have in the summer, what we're doing is juicing up our atmosphere. So when we couple those humid days with hot temperatures, we have um, a public health risk, but also uh, we're adding more moisture to the atmosphere to create those extreme rainfall events. And I just wanna note that I stole this slide from my colleague, Dr. Ken Kunkel. I was on the author team that produced the North Carolina Climate Science Report. A number of my figures come from that report and I can put the link in the chat when I'm done. But um, this is a really foundational important report for North Carolina. It's the first of its kind and it went into the risk and resiliency plan. Uh, next slide. So it's been a long year for all of us and I don't, tend to talk about the globe very much, but we can point to a number of things that are going on in our planet that show that climate change is here. And what I work in is observations of both temperature and precipitation. So last year, 2019 was the second hottest year on record for Earth. So those are two uh, major agencies that study the atmosphere. There was a press release that's coming out right now that's going to tell you that September 2020 was the hottest on record we're not seeing any of these record cold global events anymore. When these press releases land in my inbox, 
I'm almost not surprised, actually I'm not surprised when we're seeing things like second warmest and warmest. Next slide. Because we saw that in North Carolina last year, 2019 was North Carolina's warmest year on record in 125 years of record keeping. So 1990 was the previous warmest year on record until we passed that uh, threshold. And what I mean by record keeping is that we have a network of observers around the entire country who dutifully take observations of temperature and precipitation. So using a thermometer and using a rain gauge, we're out there measuring these atmospheric and environmental variables like we have since the late 1800s. And we have this really rich data set that we can see the trends in our climate over the US from. And in North Carolina, we rely on this data set pretty heavily. So this data set told us that it was the warmest year on record. And it's not really a surprise to many folks. We had a couple months with below average temperatures, but we were just consistently warm. I'll expand on this a little bit more, but where we're really seeing the warm temperatures isn't necessarily those hot days, which still give me some trouble being new to North Carolina, but it's the hot nights. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first rule of weather school, I set out to be a meteorologist and learned that I was bad at forecasting, but the first rule of forecasting is to look out the window. And you'd be surprised how many times that doesn't happen. But the first rule of being a state climatologist in a, a new state is to look at a map. And the reason we love living in North Carolina and so many people come to North Carolina is that we have so much to offer in terms of a diverse topography. We've got mountains and we've got a beautiful coastline, diverse communities. So you come to North Carolina and it's not homogenous. We have generations of folks who have lived here. For, for hundreds of years in their families. And those are very important, very crucial. And I think Jason did a really good job of explaining that. And a diverse ecology. We're in this really cool spot on the planet where we have some tropical influences, but also some cooler continental influences. So we have all sorts of interesting flora and fauna in this state. And all of that together underscores why we need to care about our climate, why we care about our climate. Because if we weren't here or those things weren't here, none of this would really matter. Uh, next slide. But we can start to feel climate change through our extremes. So it's important to know the difference between weather and climate. And one of the analogies I like to use is that weather is your mood and climate your personality. So you could be a wonderful, loving, caring person and have really bad days. What we're seeing with climate change is we're having more of those bad mood days and it's shifting our, our background state of the climate. So maybe our personality is changing a bit. And aside from the temperature record that we set in 2019, we set two new state precipitation records in 2018. And I'm going to include South Carolina because they're just across the border. But of note for us, Mount Mitchell smashed the previous statewide precipitation record by almost three feet. So we're talking 12 inches of precipitation that also includes snow up at Mount Mitchell. So we have more extreme precipitation, and certainly Hurricane Florence contributed to that, but that was just a wet year overall, much like the one we're having now. And those add up to create these annual temperature records and annual precipitation records that we're seeing. So you know, we can start to pick out events and say, we don't say did climate change cause this, but did climate change make this more likely is the question that we're asking and answering. Uh, next slide. So I like to show this before I show any sort of temperature graph. These are climate stripes. And the idea came from my colleague, colleague Ed Hawkins in the UK. And what this shows is just every single year has a bar. And if it was cooler than the historical average, which is 1971 to 2000, it gets a blue. And if it was warmer, it gets a red, a darker red, if it was more so. And you can see that over time, this starts in 1895. You know, we had cool years, we had warm years, bounced back and forth, it warmed up in the 1930s, cooled down in the 1960s. But toward the end, you see a preponderance of these dark red years. That's not to say we don't have cool years and cool months. They're not the coldest, but they're still there. 
So climate is not a stair step. Climate is not linear. If it were, my job would be a lot easier. But just because last year was our warmest year on record in North Carolina doesn't mean that this year will be warmer than that one. Uh, next slide. So this comes from the North Carolina Climate Science Report. This is the official figure showing that North Carolina has warmed about a degree Fahrenheit in the recent past. I can tell you the planet has warmed about two degrees Fahrenheit. So we're a little bit behind in part due to a cool period in the 1960s, but we have quickly caught up. Our warming has accelerated. We set that warmest year on record. 2020 is on pace to not be the warmest year on record, but another warm year for North Carolina. And I made the point about this not being a stair step and this not being linear, but if you're a betting person, you're betting on warmer than normal years in our state now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future, but when you say one degree Fahrenheit, Kathy, is what you're probably asking me, what's the big deal? If I tell you it's going to be 71 degrees tomorrow and it was 72 degrees today, you're not gonna do anything differently. But what this is, is that longer term average. So we're adding up all those bad mood days, shifting the background state enough that it has changed a degree or two degrees. And one of the analogies that I've always liked to use, but it's much more pressing right now and people are definitely thinking about it, is your body temperature. So a body temperature of 99 degrees doesn't cause you alarm, but 101 is certainly something that you start paying attention to. Uh, next slide. This is a graph from NOAA and I just pulled it out. It's showing maximum temperature over the historical past. And when you average this out, there's no trend in maximum temperature. So no trend in hot days themselves. In the 1930s were a very warm period across the entire US. And then they jump up uh, toward the end of the record. But what we're seeing is you know, a fairly flat trend. This will change, spoiler alert in the hot days. It's North Carolina, it's hot here. Um, one of the things I like to point out is that we didn't hit 100 this year. We're looking at a warm year, but we're not seeing a ton of those extreme hot days right now. Uh, next slide. Where we are seeing the trend is, like I said earlier, in the minimum temperature. So our overnight temperatures have increased dramatically over the historical past, especially in the past five years. The last five years have seen our five years of warmest overnights on record. And you can see in the graph, they just ping, ping, ping after each other. This has a number of implications. Um, it's not just you know, that you don't take a cardigan with you when you go out on a September night, but there's a public health risk here if you work outside all day in those hot temperatures, which are hot, even if the trend is fairly flat, and then you go home and you live in a place that doesn't have sufficient cooling or you don't have access to cooling, your body's already stressed and it doesn't get a chance to recover overnight if it's already in those elevated temperatures. We, we've seen a lot of public health literature on this. It's a huge, real, huge, real important risk. And then for agriculture, certain crops, our stone fruits, need a certain number of chilling hours or cool temperatures to, to develop fully. And we're not getting as many of those. And in fact, they're declining pretty rapidly. So that's a huge hit on our agricultural sector. Uh, next slide. One of the things that people ask me is, how do I talk to folks about climate change? And I'll tell you the secret, it's short messages from a trusted person that are repeated often. So I'm gonna repeat a lot of these messages uh, over and over. Hopefully I'm earning your trust, but North Carolina is warming. There's no dispute there. We see that through our observations. And we're seeing climate change now through both sea level rise and our extreme rainfall. But the other things are going to increase in the future. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And we will see disruptive sea level rise in our state. Uh, I talked to a reporter last week who broke the state down into the three obvious areas, the coastal plain, the Piedmont, and the mountains, and went through each one and said, what are the big impacts in these areas? And I said, up front, I'm going to tell you flooding for all of them. So we know that flooding isn't just caused by hurricanes. We've seen flooding this year from cutoff lows, which are just these uh, 
low pressure systems that just spin over our state and dump some rain. We had a few of those in May that caused a fair bit of damage and flooding on the coastal plain. And we've seen flooding up in our mountains as well. We just came off our 15 wet, 15th wettest September on record in North Carolina, and Asheville saw its fifth wettest September. Our strongest hurricanes are expected to become stronger. The star is there because I talked about the difference between wind and storm surge. And the people part of this is so important. Important, Like Jason said, there's increased urbanization in the Southeast and that will enhance climate vulnerabilities. More people moving to our urbanized areas, maybe living in a place that lacks sufficient shade or cooling. And then rural communities will face unique challenges with less adaptive capacity. So I know that's why many of you are here and many of you are experts in the, the challenges that rural communities face and then climate change is being added to that. Uh, next slide. So we've mostly been talking about the past and now it's time to talk about the future. So climate scientists have to study the planet that they're living on. So we don't get the luxury of having a laboratory where we have our experiments running. Our experiments need to run somewhere else because we're on the planet. So we create a planet in a computer and we do this uh, through understanding how the ocean and the atmosphere works the equations that, that guide the fluid motions of both things. Spent a number of years learning all those things. And we put that in to the computer. But then we have to tell it some things and we have to think about the future and how it may change. So the really hard part of all of this is understanding how people may act. We have seven and a half billion people on this planet and we don't necessarily understand how behaviors will change or may change. And Jason talked about how risk perception is so difficult. But we have to give a few scenarios to this computer, these climate models about how the future may change and how we may act. So the red area shows higher emissions. That means we as a planet, not we in Raleigh, we in North Carolina, don't really change our behaviors very much. We keep using fossil fuels as our main source of energy. We don't really transition to renewables. We keep using land the same way that we're, we're using it now. The green area shows lower emissions. And again, that's the entire planet. We transition to more renewables. Uh, we start adhering to some of the targets that we set in our global treaties. We reduce our use of fossil fuels pretty rapidly. So those are two scenarios for the future. And then on here you see gray and orange. So what that is, is a gut check for us climate scientists. We can recreate the 20th century because we have been measuring the temperature and the precipitation through that network that I told you about and other networks around the planet. And we can tell the climate model, and it's not just one, we, we work with many of them, which shows the spread here. Recreate the 20th century for us. Can you do that? Because if you can do that, then we have higher confidence about what you're saying going forward. So what this does say for the future is that North Carolina will continue to warm in every single season. That doesn't say that on this graph, but I'll tell you in every single season. And the range is about four degrees Fahrenheit to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And it is dependent on how we act globally. These are both dramatically different North Carolinas. I've told you we've warmed a degree Fahrenheit in the historical past, and we're already seeing impacts. Four is a big change, 10 is an enormous change. This, this warming though can change dependent on future policy. So if, the, if we do start reducing our fossil fuels pretty rapidly, we will be looking at more of that lower end. But if we keep doing what we're doing now, it will be that upper end. One thing to note is that you don't see the two scenarios diverge until about mid-century. That means we've bought into a certain amount of warming here in North Carolina. It will warm over the next few decades. And that's where we're thinking about resilience, especially. You know, we know that climate change is happening. We know it will continue to happen, even if we sign off this webinar and we find out that everyone has stopped using fossil fuels right now. So when we talk about mitigating fossil fuels, we're definitely thinking about future generations and the end of the century. Uh, next slide. When we're thinking about uh, extreme precipitation, which I've told you has already increased in North Carolina, 
it's likely that this will continue to increase in the future. So the equation that I like to use, and I took this slide from Dr. Kunkel, um, that more humid, supercharged, wet atmosphere is you know, loading us up to just have these huge rainfall events. And I mentioned it's not just hurricanes anymore. It's very likely that we're going to see these days with three plus inches of rain increase in North Carolina. And we know the trouble that this causes all over the state. What the figure is showing is just the breakdown, the higher scenario for the immediate future, some increases, especially up in the mountains. And then B and C are the lower scenario, so that green area that I showed you in the last graph, and the higher scenario, which is the red area that I showed you in the last graph, for mid-century. You see pronounced increases in the blues, especially up in the mountains, uh, some of the greens as well. There are some parts of the state that may see decreases in extreme precipitation. We know that rain doesn't fall in the same place across the state every time. Uh, next slide. Thinking about uh, the cornerstone of our economy or one of the cornerstones of our economy is our agricultural sector. We have a number of things that grow in North Carolina very, very well and are suited to North Carolina's historical or current climate. You know, thinking about our sweet potatoes and our peaches and all the wonderful things that we grow here. So when we look at our cold hardiness zone from the historical past, I just picked Greensboro for this map, but we're looking at about a zone seven, zone seven B, um, a certain amount of low temperatures that are accessible for these crops, certain things that grow very well. Uh, the next slide, please. Won't be much of a surprise. So I've told you North Carolina is going to warm in the future in all seasons. We will jump. We're projected to jump a whole zone in our cold hardiness zones. So many folks, you know, grow things because they, they know how to grow them or have been accustomed to growing them or, like I said, are well suited for North Carolina's climate. It may be that folks are thinking about planting different crops or moving into different crops, but understanding that our infrastructure and our systems are in place for very specific things. And it's not just a matter of planting something new. And then in thinking about what can grow and what can't grow, there are the things that we love and need and want to live, like our food supply, but then there are things like weeds that may not exist in North Carolina now or may not, necessarily thrive in North Carolina or plant diseases that may have a better chance of survival with these warm temperatures. So thinking about, okay, maybe there's an opportunity here to grow something new, but also how are we going to deal with these new pests and diseases and weeds? Uh, next slide. I talked about the hot days up front, how they haven't changed over the historical past. They're projected to change into the future. So that's bad news. I saw somebody uh, drop something in our chat about humidity, but thinking about the days with the heat index over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a hot day. We had a number of those this summer. Um, those are all projected to increase across the state of North Carolina in the future. So what this map is showing is the mid-century for that higher emission scenario minus the historical. And every bit of North Carolina on here is showing an increase in a number of days with the heat index over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. A little bit less in the mountains. I know I personally like to run up there and cool down, but increases along the southeast coast and in the, the very urbanized areas, Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte. Uh, next slide. And I talked about the public health risk up front. It, our folks who are working outside, you know, folks in poorer communities, folks who don't have access to sufficient cooling, are incredibly vulnerable in a warming climate. This is a public health crisis. And the outdoor laborers are the most vulnerable to heat related deaths per this uh, figure that was shown in the last national climate assessment. But this also impacts our bottom line. There will be hours and times where people cannot be outside because it will be fatal for them to be working. And you can see on this uh, figure, there's a projected change in hours worked because we will not be able to send people outside to work. That affects our bottom line, that affects our food supply. And if we're thinking about the cutoff being when it's fatal to send people outside, we have folks working <clears throat> right now in conditions where it 
is making people sick. Um, and this is by the end of the century in a high emission scenario. Uh, next slide. Hurricanes are the things that get a lot of press and rightfully so. Um, the hurricanes will be wetter because we're supercharging the atmosphere, the oceans are warmer, likely to have stronger winds that come with them. We don't know if more hurricanes will hit North Carolina. So while we're a fairly large state on the scheme of a planet and at the scheme of a and size of a global climate model, we can't necessarily tell if more hurricanes will hit us in the future. But everybody on this call knows that it really only takes one hurricane. It takes, you know, a Florence or a Matthew or a Michael or a Dorian to really disrupt communities in a way of life. This figure from the uh, North Carolina Climate Science Report just catalogs the total number of tropical events that we've seen in our state, you know, an uptick in the late 1800s, certainly a lot in the early 2000s, but again, it really only takes one. And the things that we need to be concerned about in hurricanes, the flooding, the storm surge, the intense precipitation that comes along with them. Uh, next slide. Uh, sunny day flooding or nuisance flooding is already occurring in places like Wilmington. You've certainly either experienced it or have heard, heard of somebody who has. We're looking at about 70 days a year now. And this is the kind of flooding that floods your basement or floods your car, means you can't go down a road, um, cuts off access to certain places. It really is nuisance. And in a warming climate, the projected number of nuisance flooding days for Wilmington is projected to increase pretty significantly in that higher emission scenario. So what this graph is showing is almost every single day in a higher emission scenario by mid-century, Wilmington will see nuisance, high tide, sunny day flooding. And then in a lower emission scenario, it's certainly less, but there's still some of that there. The seas will continue to rise for the next few decades. Uh, I think this is my last slide coming up. So North Carolina is rapidly changing. We're in a different North Carolina. Folks like to ask me if this is the new normal. The new normal is a checkpoint right here. We're going to move into another new normal and another new normal. And this is all dependent on uh, global policy. If we can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, then we can mitigate some of that warming and some of the impacts. But this is also why it's so important for us in North Carolina at the community level to think about resilience because we can't control the entire planet. And just quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, that means temperatures outside of the historical envelope. I told you North Carolina will warm, has warmed one degree. And then in the future, by the end of the century, anywhere from four to 10, disruptive sea level rise. We talked a lot about extreme rainfall and how it's already occurring through a number of mechanisms, either thunderstorms, cut off lows, nor'easters or hurricanes. Uh, more intense hurricanes, so stronger winds, and then higher absolute humidity levels, which is a real drag if those August days bring you down. Um, and I think I have one more slide. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's incredibly uh, difficult sometimes to talk in this Zoom world because I would rather be in a room with you and chatting with you afterward. And I know I'm gonna take some of your questions, but. Thank you for your attention. I know that many things are competing for it these days. I would love to hear from you. That's my Twitter handle. Um, reach out to the climate office if you need any assistance in understanding climate or just wanna talk through some things. Um, my door, my virtual door is always open. So thank you again, Jason. And thank you, Kathy. Um, well, that was, that was fascinating, uh, slightly harrowing. Um, I, I'm reminded, Kathy, uh, I, I heard the phrase somewhere that um, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, but I think we're seeing in North Carolina that, um, that the effects of, of climate change that we, we see globally is being pretty well distributed here in, in North Carolina. Um, as I suggested earlier, we have some, some equity issues around that in terms of some people being affected more based on where they're living and their ability to respond. So what I want to do is, is close out quickly here with a couple slides uh, before we go to Q&A to talk about um, the economic impact.
So I, I've been on a learning curve um, to understand the, the issues rural North Carolina is confronting. That's part of my, my, my job. I, I, I'm very, very fortunate in that, re in that respect that I can, I can study and, 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 and learn from these things. So in the course of my study, I came across this table uh, that's in a state climate summary um, webpage that um, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration does. And in the email update that went out to all the registered participants Monday, um, we have a link into that, that North Carolina part of that, that summary. But, but this, this table jumped out at me, okay? So this is looking at um, over time from 1980 through 2000, uh, the number of natural disasters, drought, flooding, freeze, severe storms, cyclones, wildfires, winter storms, maybe even, even locusts, um, that, that had an economic impact of over $1 billion, okay? So there are a couple things to point out here, and, and, I, and I wish I had a, if I, if I had control of the screen, I would point out that in the 1980s, if you look at a year, um, you see one point, uh, okay, there we go, thank you. Um, the, that's the average events per year. If you go down to the 2010s, 2010 to 2019, you see the frequency rise to 3.3. 3. Um, that's a big jump, that's a big jump, okay. So, and now let's look at the, the, the economic impact of that. If, if you look over to the, to the far right column, percent of total costs, okay, okay, again, this is again from 1980 through 2020, we see that in the last five years, 44.5% of the total cost of the economic impact has occurred in the past five years. That's an astronomical figure. And it really points to not only the increased frequency, but as Kathy suggested, to the increased intensity of the damage. Again, Hurricane Florence was a measly little category one hurricane. But we measured that that on the on the cipher scale by mainly by, by wind, okay? But that storm hung around for days and it and it inundated us. So so to me, this was just reinforced what the economic impact and the economic reality is of the climate change we are beginning to see and the vulnerability that so many communities in North Carolina are, are going to experience. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just showed you sort of estimates for total economic impact. Um, and in here, it's, it's a little bit different number. It's looking at what the actual federal and state economic recovery response has been to hurricanes uh, Matthew and Florence. Again, remember, we had these two storms happen in a, in a very short couple year interval. So cl collectively, it was three and a half billion dollars. Um, now that, that's a huge amount of, a, of an allocation from you know budgets that are are, are limited that are that are fixed, um, and I would also point out again from the, the just that economic impact. I mean that was between fifty and a hundred billion dollars, but you know insurance companies are picking up some of that. Uh, people who don't have insurance are having to pay it out of pocket, or or they're just absorbing the damage. So the, the fiscal ability of the federal government and the state government to be able to respond to the totality of economic um, impact from extreme weather events is, is a fraction of the total impact, um, as great as it is. So as with everything, the, this has an economic consequence and how we prepare as communities how we prepare as a state, it, it can have a measurable difference. So I will close on that. Um, and I am, um, I'm pleased to turn it back over to my, my wonderful colleague, Misty Hergut, who's going to, to, uh, to 
to follow through on our Q&A period. I've seen that we've got, we've got seven questions queued up and I've taken a peek at them and they're quite good and I, and, uh, uh, and I look forward to, for myself and, and especially uh, Dr. Dello to, uh, to answer your questions. So thank you. Thank you, Jason and Dr. Dello. That was a, a great presentation and I've been seeing a lot of activity on social media around it. So um, we appreciate you all sharing uh, this really important critical information. Uh, and again, hope that you will uh, join us for the other three that we'll talk about a little bit later. So I'm going to move to the Q&A. And, and as Jason mentioned, we have seven uh, questions in here. We are going to try uh, to respond to as many of these as possible. Um, so I'm going to stop talking so that you all can get your questions answered. Um, and if we can start with the first one, what policies locally can aid in addressing these climate change related issues? Yeah, so I see I have to give good answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure, no pressure, Kat. No pressure. There are a lot of things that um, we can do locally. So like I said, this is a global problem, but communities and states, and North Carolina is one, can be leaders in addressing this issue. The atmosphere doesn't stop at our border. We can't just pin the blame on the worst emitters or the worst polluters. There's a lot of transportation planning that can be done to help uh, reduce vehicle travel, um, make bike lanes, make streets safer for folks to use alternative forms of transportation. We can think about some cities for solar and wind um, and other renewable energies. You know, there's a lot that can be done. Um, everybody wants to know what the most, what they can do for climate change. The most important thing you can do is vote. So exercise your right to vote and work in your local communities, work in local politics and local planning. Your voice is so necessary and so needed in those areas. And, and I, would, I would add to this, just to make a plug um, for a question next week uh, it, it, that we titled sort of ra raising the, raising the load-bearing walls. And we're gonna feature Dr. Jessica Whitehead from the North Carolina North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resilience, and she's going to address some specific areas where localities can act, you know, for example, in natural infrastructure that can help um, reduce flooding, um, some strategies around housing, some strategies around transportation. And we're also going to have uh, Kim Colson from the North Carolina DEQ Office of, uh, of Water Infrastructure to talk about how um, communities can work together to limit the, the risk that water infrastructure faces. So there are practical steps. Stay tuned. Yeah, I have the bad news and Dr. Whitehead has the good answers. You want to you want to take that next one, Kathy? Um, what is it? Do your um, models take into account the impacts of increased impervious surface areas in Wake and Johnston counties on flooding in Wayne and Lenore counties? Uh, so the global climate models are just representations of the ocean and atmosphere and how they interact. When we're thinking about impervious surfaces and how uh, development upstream uh, harms communities downstream. There are a number of folks working on this with uh, specific flooding models and understanding how changing the character of the watershed in certain areas, usually populated affluent areas, can harm folks downstream. So there is some flooding work that's being done at UNC by one of my colleagues. Um, a lot of folks are thinking about that, but the climate models are just showing kind of what's coming out of the sky and then other folks are taking that and then putting it into their models. And, and I, I would just add though that, that regional water system management, uh, base, basin, water basin management is a, is a huge issue. Um, it requires regional consensus building and cooperation to understand that for example, that you know, here in Wake County, we're on the upper end of the Deuce River Basin, and that that flows into Albemarle Sound. And you know, and I've I've heard complaints from commercial fishermen in Albemarle Sound saying that you know what what happens up in the upper part of the, the, the basin in terms of wastewater and floodwater management um, impacts their lives. 
So we're, we're all connected in that respect. Great, thank you all. Um, next question is, can you talk about the difference between modeled historical and observations? I'm not sure that um, everything is included there. Is that clear? It's clear. Uh, so observations are, you have your thermometer and your rain gauge and something happens that day, you get a little bit of rain or you go out and measure the temperature that day and you record it. So we've been recording those over time and that's how we get the observations. Modeled historical is taking that planet that we built in the computer, knowing what we know about the ocean and atmosphere, knowing what we know about the historical past, and telling it to recreate it. So run it, essentially, a modeler would yell at me for saying this, but running it backwards, telling it, okay, not so much the future, but try to recreate the past based on the information we've given you about how the ocean and atmosphere work together, all those, million equations at one point I knew very well. Um, and that's a gut check for us because if it reproduced something that was completely off from those observations, those measurements that we take, then we wouldn't think very much about what it was saying for the future. But they, they've been calibrated and do a pretty good job at representing the past. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have a, a new director of a long-term recovery group based in Wilmington um, who would like to learn more about physical infrastructure side, especially best practices for hazard mitigation. Are there recommended uh, resources for this kind of information, state level or regional entities, higher education expertise, et cetera? Jason? Um. Again, I, I think I think Kathy. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Jessica Whitehead. Um, next week, will be able to to address that. Um, I think there's a lot of work being done um, nationally through the American Planning Association, looking at best practices around hazard mitigation. Um, I think we can we could probably follow up on this a little bit more, and, and I think I'm going to refer this question on to uh, to, to Jess Whitehead and and Dr. Amanda Martin at uh, Incor, who I think are, are, are would have a far higher level of a um, far stronger response on that than I, than I could. But it's a very good question. Thank you for asking because it's it's the essential how to questions we we've got to address. Um, and <clears throat> Dr. Della, you mentioned impacts on agriculture, which is the state's largest economy. Are there examples of other major industries in the state of, high, of higher risk if they do not develop plans for resiliency? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Almost all of them. I'm thinking of the tourism industry, which is a huge part of our economy as well. Um, thinking about some of these large companies that are setting up big uh, server warehouses that need water for cooling. I mean, climate really does touch everything, thinking about the insurance industry and the banking industry, which we have a fair bit of here in North Carolina. Um, I don't, I can't think of a single sector that is let off the hook by climate change. Um, next question, any changes noted in the Gulf Stream in the last few years? I haven't looked at that specifically. I can follow up with whoever asked that and pull out some recent research. Okay. Well, and we will have, we will capture these questions so uh, we can follow back up. And also um, back to J uh, Jason's point about referring um, the previous question about resources to um, Jess Whitehead. She has responded in the Q&A saying she will make sure to include that next week. Um, so that would be in the in the webinar next week. Uh, are there models for impacts to human health and health care delivery as a result of climate change that have been developed? Yes. Um, so if you were to ask me what's the thing that keeps what's the thing that keeps me up the most at night with climate change in North Carolina, it's our public health risks. So there are epidemiologists who are taking those inputs from the big global <laughs> climate models that we're giving them and 
modeling how diseases and vector-borne diseases may change in the future. Um, I'm also not an expert in this, but I can point folks to, to other researchers in North Carolina who are doing this work. And, 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 and I, would, I would add, I, I, I wear a, a bunch of different hats at the Rural Center in terms of issues I'm dealing with, and, and, and one of which I spend a lot of time on these days is um, around rural health policy, specifically um, the, 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 the economic impacts of um, <clears throat> rural communities who, in a state where we have not passed Medicaid expansion. In rural areas, we have very stressed healthcare delivery networks in our rural areas. We've had, I think, seven or eight rural hospitals close over the past uh, 15 years. Um, a lot of rural health practitioners have been hurt by the pandemic. Um, and it makes it difficult um, in rural areas where there's um, higher degrees of co comorbidity in terms of uh, obesity, in terms of diabetes, in terms of heart issues. So the, these are populations who are at risk, okay? And, and there's an equity element in this. Um, how do we need, meet the needs of these people in a, in a, warming, in a warming climate? So um, again, it, it's relevant for, for folks who have to work outside. It's relevant for those who are not running their air conditioning all the time because they have trouble paying an electric bill. So as, as Kathy said, this, the health implications of this are quite real. Uh, we have a, a couple more questions that have come in. Um, this one is um, an individual on the call is doing flood resilience research in Wilmington and looking at the hourly rainfall record to come up with new design storms and green infrastructure design guidance. How much more frequently will these intense uh, category three or greater storms be? A rough estimate. <laughs> Let me follow up with that person. <laughs> okay, we will save that one. Um, also, just to point out to all of you on uh, the call, in the Q&A section, there are also folks responding to some of these questions that um, could be of help and, and be a good resource for you as well. So uh, we don't just have questions in here. We have some, some good responses and, and potential resources for you. That's great. That's great. Um, another, one other question that has just come through. Um, all citizens need to be aware of the information presented today. Do you have any plans available to make this happen? Um, I'm happy to go ahead and address this one. I was going to cover it at the end of the call, but yes, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar along with the slides um, by Monday to all of you and you can feel free to share that. Yeah, and in the North Carolina Climate Science Report, uh, we added a two page just plain language summary that anybody could pick up and digest the 240 pages of the report pretty quickly. So that's a good resource too. Okay, last call for uh, any more burning questions before we wrap up here. And again, if you uh, think of questions you might have later, uh, you can reach out to uh, Jason Gray or Dr. Dello with those questions. Um, I hope that's okay. I just volunteered their services. Uh, or any of us at the Rural Center, we're happy to try to, uh, try to funnel them to the right person to get the answers. So thank you all again for your engagement and your participation. Uh, Jason, or Kathy, do you all have anything uh, you want to say before we wrap up with kind of the final logistics here? No, this was great. I look forward to the rest of the series. Um, and it was great answering your questions and getting to chat with you, Misty and, Gray, uh, Misty and Jason. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, just to a couple of follow-up items. Again, we really appreciate you all taking the time to, to join us today. This is uh, really critical for us to think about as a state and to work together and, and get this right moving forward. So thank you for your time again. We do, as I mentioned earlier, have three 
additional webinars coming up this month that will all focus on building resilient communities. Our next one is next Thursday, October 15th at 11 a.m. And the topic for that one will be uh, lifting the load bearing walls, resilient strategies at work in your community. Uh, for all of these, you can visit our website, ncruralcenter.org, scroll down, it's on the home page, uh, and it will give you a lot more detailed information about each session, the presenters, and how to register. Uh, the next one will be October 21st at 11. Uh, you all can see it here on the screen, and this will focus on equity and inclusion principles to assure participation for everyone in the community. And then the 28th, building of warmth and light, strategies to support rural leaders facing challenging conditions. So um, we have a great lineup of speakers over the next three weeks. Again, I encourage you to go to our webpage to look at more detailed descriptions for the sessions and to read the bios um, of these great presenters that, that we have lined up. One more reminder that you will be getting a survey emailed to you after this call. So uh, please take a few brief moments to complete that, to give us your, your input. It's, it's very important to us. Um, and then you also get a chance to win this deluxe personal safety emergency pack. Uh, compliments of the American Red Cross. Uh, I wanna thank them again for their generous support uh, for the webinar series. Also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on Monday, you will receive an email, or by Monday, with the webinar recording, the slides, and a reminder to complete the survey if you have not done so already. So thank you all again. I uh, appreciate your participation. Hope that you will be joining us for the next three, uh, and, and, and truly appreciate your engagement and, and your excellent questions today, too. Thanks, and have a great day.